Hi, I'm Joel. I'm here in Sanakilowak, Nunavut, in the heart of Hudson Bay, um, which is where our little charity, the Arctic Eider Society, is based. And I'm really excited today to be able to share a lesson plan with you from our Arctic Sea Ice Educational Package called Dive to Survive. And uh, this is one of the original lesson plans that we worked on, and uh, I'm, I'm really psyched about it because it's actually based on some of the first work that I did when I showed up to Sanakilowak. Um, a long time ago to help the community address some priorities about uh, how eider ducks get through the winter. And so uh, the lesson plan is going to cover a few different things. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about eider ducks and what they do to get through the winter time. And we're going to watch them dive underneath the water and that's how I got started here, was watching ducks diving. And uh, we're going to learn a little bit about the biomechanics of diving against the currents. We'll learn a little bit about how math can help you solve some of these problems in biology. Um, a little problem that I like to think in the context of um, the flight speed of the unladen sparrow. Hold! Listen, in order to maintain airspeed velocity, a swallow needs to beat its wings 43 times every second, right? Please! Am I right? I'm not interested. What? is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. What do you mean? An African or European swallow? Huh? I, I don't know that. Who <laughs> didn't know? So much about swallows. Well, you have to know these things when you're a king, you know. Here are two eiders. This is a male on the bottom and a female on the top taking off from a plinia uh, on the Belcher Islands. And here you can see, uh, this is a, a scene from People of a Feather. Um, traditionally, people made clothing out of the eider skins, and today they collect the eider down uh, to make modern parkas. And this was the topic of our award-winning film, People of a Feather. Um, which you, so if you want to learn a little bit more about eiders and the unique culture of Senekiluak, um, you can watch that film as well. And the Belcher Islands are located here in the heart of Hudson Bay. And this is where the community of Santa Kilowak is based and where eider spend the winter. So if you want to learn a little bit more about eider ducks, you can go to CQ and you can browse. Um, you can go to explore and look for wildlife. You can go to the profile of the eider duck, Mitik, in Inuktitut. And so you can learn a little bit more about their natural history. Um, you can watch some videos about their them diving. Um, you can see the feed here shows a bunch of hunting stories that have been collected by different communities um, interacting with eiders. And you can also see them in the context of the food web, um, which is a, a theme of another lesson plan where you can kind of map out um, the different animals and their predator-prey interactions. So here you can learn a little bit of eider ducks. They, they dive underneath the ice to feed on mussels and sea urchins, which they swallow whole. Um, and they also have to deal with predators um, so they have to deal with foxes, can get them when they're on the ice. Um, snowy owls can take them on the wing. We have uh, the gulls can take their eggs in the summertime. And occasionally we've even seen polar bears um, showing up with eider ducks in their stomach and hunting them. And of course, for Senekilo um they're a very important source of food. So this is kind of the, the ecological context of the eider in winter here uh, in Senekiloak. So you can browse on Siku and learn a little bit more about that. They spend their winters in plinias, which are openings in the sea ice, so that they are maintained by strong tidal currents. So they're basically like an oasis um, for eiders to spend the winter in and to dive and get food. They're very productive with the currents. And so we are going to take you to Ulutztuk Plinia, and we're going to watch some videos of eiders diving, and we're going to look at um, some of the details of their biomechanics. This is at a plinia and we can watch um, eiders diving underneath the ice. So they dive under the ice into the current uh, to get down to the bottom. So you can see they kind of breathe quite a bit before they go, get ready to dive. They use their wings and their feet to get down. They kind of time their feet um, and sync with their wings. Here you can see there's a big group diving. Um, once they get to the bottom, they're looking for food, mussels and urchins, um, sometimes little prey between them. Sometimes they'll find a fish, um, but their most, their, their most common prey is the mussel, the blue mussel. And so um, they, when they find mussels, they will swallow their food whole.
So pretty amazing. Once they're done at the bottom, they just have to stop and they can just rock it up. They're buoyant. And so here you can see an eider bringing up a bunch of mussels and swallowing them. Here's one gaining a sea urchin. And they bring it up, they toss it around a little bit, break off the spines and uh, swallow it whole. And then they crush it up in their stomachs. So they're pretty, they're pretty tough birds, um, pretty cool to see them diving. And part of the question that we had here was, um, how do they get through the winter? We were seeing that some years they weren't making it and some of the birds were getting stuck in the ice and dying. And so the community was interested to, to do a study to learn more about their ecology, to understand the sorts of conditions um, that affect their ability to get through the winter. And so the way to look at this question was to start with some of the basics um, of how they dive and how much energy it costs to dive, the different conditions that they're diving in, and then build up from there to understand how that affects the population as a whole. Okay, so um, one of the first things we're going to look at, we're going to take this video and we're going to count how long it takes the eider to get um, from the surface of the water to the bottom. So we're going to count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi. So it took about seven seconds for that uh, male eider to get down to the bottom in diving video one. Okay, so this is the worksheet, and so we're going to record the distance to the bottom, which we know was 10 meters, and the time to the bottom, which was 7 seconds. Okay, the next step in the lesson plan is to draw a triangle based on the information that we've gathered before. Uh, the depth of the water, 10 meters, the path of the eider, and the dive angle. So basically, we're going to start right here with the dot at the top, and we know it was 10 meters, and so we're going to draw our line from the top of the surface to 10 meters. Okay. And we had the angle of 20 degrees. So take your protractor and draw an angle at 20 degrees. So this is actually the travel path of the bird. And we can fill this in at 20 degree angle. And then we'll just close up our triangle here at the bottom. This is the distance that the bird traveled from where it started along the, relative to the bottom of the ocean there. And so one property of this is that it is a right triangle. There is a 90 degrees right here and there's properties of a right triangle that we can use to estimate we know the depth um, and from this angle that is the adjacent side of the triangle. This is the opposite the opposite and this which is straight across from the 90 degrees is the hypotenuse and so we can use basic trigonometry in order to figure out the hypotenuse which is the actual travel path the distance that the bird dove and the opposite which is the distance on, along the bottom um, that it traveled so and so uh, we can do a quick search here for trigonometry uh, for right triangle and find all the formulas um, that you would have learned and would need to memorize or have a reference. Uh, and so in order to figure out what the hypotenuse is and the opposite, we can use the sine, the cosine, the tangent, um, and those are the ones that we'll focus on today. Mostly we're trying to find what the hypotenuse was and we have the adjacent. Um, and we have the adjacent and so, and we have the angle, theta, which is right here. And so, if we look at cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and so that's the formula that's going to let us use the angle and the adjacent to calculate the hypotenuse, which is what we're trying to get here. But first we have to do um, a little bit of algebra, and so we can say cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse and in order to do, we have to multiply both sides by hypotenuse the hypotenuse times cos theta is equal to the adjacent and we want to find we're solving for the hypotenuse and so we can divide both sides by cosine of theta the hypotenuse is equal to the adjacent over 
cos theta. Uh, in this case, we know that cos theta is 20 degrees and that the adjacent is 10 meters. So we're going to, which is 10 over cos 20 degrees. And so then we can go to our scientific calculator here and we can put in 20 and figure out what the cosine of 20 is, which is 0.9397. And so the answer is 10 over 10 divided by 0.9397 which is equal to 10.64. And so here on the worksheet, uh, we gave you the formula down there anyway, which was 10 over 0 0.9397, which is equal to 10.64 meters. Uh, now, the next thing that we can do is we know the distance which is 10.64 and we know the time from uh, watching the video which was seven seconds and so now we can actually figure out what the speed was which is equal to if we use our calculator and do 10.64 divided by 7 we get 1.52 and that's in meters and seconds so our answer is in meters per second 1.52 meters per second is now we know the swim speed of the eider when it was diving to get to the bottom. Now, if we also wanted to learn what the bottom was, this distance that has traveled over the bottom, we could use trigonometry, but another way to use it is the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem um, is a pretty classic example of math, and it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so we already know uh, the C is always the hypotenuse, um, A and B can be either sides, and so we are trying to find um, side B. And so, in order to solve for this, we go down to the Pythagorean theorem. And here we're trying to solve for the opposite. So we need to solve this equation for the opposite. So in order to get, we want to get the opposite over on one side, and so we're going to have to sub, um, subtract adjacent from both sides to get opposite squared, and then take the square root. So opposite squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared minus the adjacent squared. So basically, we just subtracted adjacent from both sides. We now have to take the square root of both sides. So the opposite is equal to the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the adjacent squared. And because we know both of these, uh, we know that the hypotenuse, which we calculated before, was 10.64 squared minus the adjacent, which was 10 squared. This is all still under the square root. And if we work that out, we can get, uh, you can use a calculator to work that out. And the answer is 3.64 meters. So then we can go back up to here and put in 3.64 meters. So now we know um, just from watching, getting the time and the depth, we were able to calculate the, the distance that the bird traveled, the speed that it traveled there, as well as the distance that it moved along the bottom, just from some basic simple math. Another example here on the worksheet that if you want to try, um, thinking about a situation where it was diving at a different angle and took longer to get to the bottom. So if you want to practice, um, there's another option for you there on the worksheet as well. Okay, so now we've learned a little bit how we can use some trigonometry and the Pythagorean theorem um, just to take some basic information that we from the video to understand the swim speed of the eider, how far it traveled along the bottom, all these questions like, not unlike the, uh, the flight speed of an unladen sparrow, in this case, the diving speed of an eider in the currents. Um, but we, the example we've considered so far um, hasn't considered a current. So now we're gonna think about the plinia, and the plinia is maintained by these strong ocean currents. Um, they bring in lots of food, they keep the ice from freezing on the top. Um, but in order to get to the bottom, the eiders have to dive against those currents. 
and they can get really fast. They can get really faster than a river. So we had this instrument called an aqueduct, which we put in uh, to the edge of the ice. It would measure the speed of the currents every minute throughout the whole day. So whenever we filmed an eider diving, we knew how fast the current was at the same time. We're going to use vector math in order to look at both the speed of the eider relative to the water versus relative to the bottom. So we've mostly been considering relative to the bottom, but now we're going to consider the swim speed relative to the moving water. So here we have a plenty of same area. It's about 10 meters deep. But now instead of the currents being slack, we're measuring the currents and we know that they're about 0.8 meters per second, which is pretty fast. That's, uh, that's almost like a river. And so it's just about this point that they have to stop diving and can't dive anymore. In watching the second video, we've seen that it took about 10 seconds for the bird to get down to the bottom and that the current velocity was 0 0.8 meters per second. Then it was diving directly into that current. So now we can figure out what the speed, which is distance over time, um, and we know the depth was 10 meters and the time was 10 seconds. And so this is gonna be an easy one. 1.0 meters per second is the speed that the observed speed of the bird swimming relative to the bottom. But now the interesting thing is we want to think, we're going to think about this in the context of the oncoming current as well. So we know, first let's just draw out, um, we know that in this case it kind of went straight down to the bottom. 1.0 meters per second uh, from the surface. And we know that the current was coming at 0.8 meters per second. And so we can draw that like this. 0 0.8 meters per second. And in order to be able to, to get down to the bottom, we're gonna, we're, the eider has to swim against the current at that speed. And so we're gonna assume, um, just for a simple example here, that the bird is swimming at exactly, in order to get straight to the bottom, he's swimming at exactly the same speed as the current, which is 0 0.8 meters per second. And so basically these two, you can add and subtract vectors, basically these two cancel themselves out to get us this observed straight dive here to the bottom. So this is observed uh, relative to the bottom. If we wanted to, everything is relative, of course. So if we wanted to measure the effective swim speed of the bird relative to the current, then we can consider this vector. So we're considering, we now have a vector this way and the bird is effectively swimming 0.8 meters per second this way. So the effective swim speed, we can calculate, we can just rough this out um, for right now as the result of these two vectors. And so, and that's the effective swim speed relative to the current, which is what we're really interested in because that's the uh, energy cost that the bird has to incur is what it's swimming relative to the current. And so in order to do this, um, we can lay it out here. We can move this vector down to the bottom. We know it's 0 0.8. And again, we have our right triangle here. And so we can, the same way we did for distance, we can use Pythagorean theorem in order to solve for the hypotenuse, which is the effective swim speed of the bird relative to the current. And so we're back to the Pythagorean theorem there. And as before, we solved to figure out that the hypotenuse is the square root of the adjacent squared plus opposite squared. In this case, uh, we're trying to find the hypotenuse, which is the velocity, the effective velocity relative to the moving current. And we know that that's the square root of the observed velocity squared plus the current, which is also the horizontal swim speed. We're just gonna call it current because it's the same. So for current squared. And so we just basically have to fill these in. 
And so we have the square root of the observed was 1 meter per second squared plus 0 0.8 squared. And if we work that out with a calculator, we get 1.28 meters per second. That's our effective swim speed. So we can put that back up here is 1.28 meters per second. So even though what we observed was the bird diving over 10 seconds to get 10 meters to the bottom at 1 meter per second, but because the current was coming at 0.8 meters per second and it was having to balance that out, its effective swim speed was really 1.28 meters per second in this trajectory, even though this is what we observed. Okay, so we've now worked out um, both the velocity of the idler relative to moving current, um, as well as the distance traveled. And uh, so that's some pr pretty simple use of trigonometry in the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it was a little bit more complicated because the angles were changing, uh, but I wanted to show you how that math formally laid the groundwork for understanding the energetics of idlers. And so we published this in a paper in uh, the Journal of Experimental Biology, looking at how they regulate their swim speed. And after looking at a bunch of dives of eiders in a bunch of different current speeds, we're able to plot out what, how long it took them to get to the bottom as a function of the current speed. And you can see from this graph that we saw, as the currents get faster, there's an exponential increase in the time it takes them to get down to the bottom. Um, as well, we saw that the number of times they have to flap their wings, the number of wing stroke cycles, also increases non-linearly with the current velocity. Um, the interesting thing though is that the frequency at which they flap their wings, there was no change over time. So they're basically, they're flapping their wings at a constant rate um, over time in order to get down to the bottom, but because they have to go against the currents, they, it takes them a lot more time and a lot more number of times flapping their wings to get there. And so um, we use that then to look at the energetics of how does the energetics of diving change as a function of the current speed um, we saw that basically the effective swim speed, that just like we calculated from that vector, um, increases a little bit, but the descent speed drastically decreases. And so that means it takes more time to get to the bottom. Even though they're swimming about the same effective speed, it takes them more time to get down to the bottom. And uh, another thing, we learned that that means that there's less time for them to feed before they have to go back and catch their breath again. So that was a really important first step in understanding the diving ecology of the eiders was this biomechanics. Um, so <laughs> bringing it back to our example about the flight speed of an unladen sparrow, here we have an unladen eider driving to the bottom against the, the swim speed, uh, against the current speed, and in this case the current is providing the burden um, that it has to go up against. And so, you know, this was a joke in the Monty Python sketch, but uh, some of these things can be really fundamental questions um, in biology and those energetics can help us scale up to the population level as well. And so I hope you learned something there. Um, it was an exciting study for me. One of my friends, Jessica Meir, um, also studied similar things in penguins diving in Antarctica, looking at their physiology as well. She actually imprinted bar-headed geese so she could train them to fly in a flight chamber. These bar-headed geese migrate over the Himalaya mountains. And so she uh, built her career based on studying some of these things and now she works for NASA, she's an astronaut, and she's studying similar things on the International Space Station. So um, though Monty Python might have joked about the, the flight speed of an unladen sparrow, these things can be pretty important questions and, uh, and take you some pretty amazing places. Thank you, I hope you learned something.